Welcome to Emergency Insights. I'm your host, James Carter. Today, we're discussing beta blocker overdose. Joining me is Dr. Emily Wang, a distinguished expert in toxicology and emergency medicine. Thank you for being here, Dr. Wang. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure to be here to discuss this important topic. Dr. Wang, beta blockers are so widely prescribed. What makes an overdose of these medications so dangerous? Beta blockers are used for a variety of conditions, from hypertension to migraines. However, in an overdose situation, their primary mechanism, blocking beta adrenergic receptors, leads to a cascade of dangerous effects. The most critical are profound bradycardia and hypotension due to decreased heart rate and contractility. In severe cases, this can rapidly progress to cardiogenic shock, coma, and even cardiac arrest. A key point, especially with pediatric patients, is the risk of impaired gluconeogenesis and glycogenolysis, which can lead to severe hypoglycemia. That's a critical point, especially regarding children. When a patient presents to the emergency department with a potential overdose, what are the key clinical features that should immediately raise suspicion for beta blocker toxicity? The two cardinal signs are bradycardia and hypotension. Any patient with unexplained low heart rate and low blood pressure should be screened for a potential overdose, particularly if there's a history of access to these medications. Other red flags include an altered mental status, and in patients with a history of asthma, you might see bronchospasm. Less common, but severe signs include seizures and a range of cardiac conduction abnormalities, like prolonged PR intervals or even a widened QRS complex in severe cases. The diagnostic process must be rapid. What initial investigations should we prioritize to confirm our suspicions and rule out other conditions? You're absolutely right. Speed is essential. First, a rapid capillary glucose check is non-negotiable. Hypoglycemia can be an immediate danger. In terms of diagnostics, the most crucial tool is a 12-lead ECG. We're looking for conduction delays, specifically a prolonged PR interval, or in severe toxicity, a broad QRS. We also need to check for QT prolongation, especially if sotolol is involved. Blood tests for electrolytes and renal function are also important, though definitive drug levels are often not timely enough to guide immediate management. It's also vital to consider and rule out other causes, like calcium channel blocker overdose, which can present very similarly. Once we've made the diagnosis, let's move to management. After the initial ABCs of resuscitation, what are the first steps for decontamination and treatment of the cardiovascular collapse? The first priority is always securing the airway and supporting circulation. If a patient presents within one to two hours of ingestion and their airway is protected, activated charcoal can be beneficial. For sustained release formulations, we might consider whole bowel irrigation. For the cardiovascular effects, initial therapy is often IV fluids, but they are rarely sufficient alone. Atropine is a common first-line agent for bradycardia, but similarly, it often provides only a temporary or partial response in a beta blocker overdose. This is where we need to escalate quickly. So what are the most effective antidotes and advanced therapies once the initial steps prove insufficient? Our mainstays for beta blocker overdose are glucagon and high-dose insulin euglycemia therapy or HIET. Glucagon acts on the heart to increase heart rate and contractility, bypassing the beta receptors. We typically give a large IV bolus followed by a continuous infusion. HIET is a game changer. It involves a bolus of regular insulin followed by an infusion, which improves myocardial glucose uptake and contractility. It's crucial to co-administer glucose and monitor potassium levels closely to prevent hypoglycemia and hypokalemia. If these fail to stabilize the patient, vasopressors like epinephrine should be started and titrated to a mean arterial pressure of at least 60 millimeters mercury. For highly lipophilic agents like propanolol, lipid emulsion therapy should be considered for its lipid sink effect. We've discussed these specific therapies. What about other complications like seizures or arrhythmias? 
For seizures, the first-line treatment is IV benzodiazepines. For arrhythmias, such as QT prolongation or torsadi points, which are particularly a risk with sotolol, IV magnesium sulfate is the standard of care. If a patient's QRS complex is widened, indicating sodium channel blockade, IV sodium bicarbonate is a critical intervention. In the most severe refractory cases, we must consider advanced options like extracorporeal life support, or ECMO, which can be life-saving, especially in younger patients. This is clearly a complex, multifaceted clinical scenario. What is the appropriate disposition and monitoring for a patient who has experienced a beta-blocker overdose? Every patient with a symptomatic beta blocker overdose must be admitted to a monitored setting, an ICU or high dependency unit. Continuous cardiac and hemodynamic monitoring is essential. We need to check blood glucose frequently, especially if using HIET. For sustained release agents or with sotolol, patients require prolonged observation, sometimes for 72 to 92 hours to ensure no delayed toxicity. And finally, for any intentional overdose, a psychiatric assessment is mandatory before discharge. Thank you, Dr. Wang. Your insights have been incredibly valuable. This is a critical topic for all healthcare providers, and your guidance on rapid diagnosis and aggressive multimodal management is exactly what our listeners need. My pleasure, James. The key takeaway is to act fast and escalate therapy quickly. Don't hesitate to consult toxicology or poison control. It's a team effort. That's an excellent point to end on. A big thank you to Dr. Wang for sharing her expertise. And thank you, our listeners, for tuning in to Emergency Insights. We'll see you on the next episode. Beta blocker overdose is serious, a real emergency. Absolutely life-threatening. We're looking at glucagon today, how it can potentially help. Yes, it's a key agent we consider. It has a unique way of working in this specific situation. So how does it actually work? What's the mechanism inside the heart? Well, it targets cardiac glucagon receptors directly. Okay, specific glucagon receptors. Exactly. And this is crucial because in this overdose, the beta-1 adrenergic receptors are blocked. Glucagon essentially finds another door in. It bypasses them. Makes sense. So what happens then at the cellular level? Uh, it activates GS proteins. Think of them like messengers or switches. Switches, okay. Yeah, turning things on. This activation boosts an enzyme called adenyl cyclus. Yeah, adenyl cyclus. Got and it. that increases the levels of intracellular cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP, that's the important molecule here. It's a key secondary messenger, yes. Mm -hmm. This rise in cyclic AMP leads to the desired effects. Which are, what do we actually see the heart doing differently? Two main things. First, Enhanced heart muscle contractility that's positive in entropy. The heart squeezes harder. Stronger pump. Precisely. And second, an increased heart rate positive chronotropy. It beats faster. Okay, so harder and faster. Basically helping the heart overcome the beta blockade. That's the idea. It allows the heart to function better despite the beta blockers being on board. Now, you said the idea. Does it always work like that? Is glucagon a reliable antidote? Ah, that's a critical point. No, it's definitely not guaranteed. Right. Effectiveness really varies patient to patient. You have to use it with realistic expectations. It's not a magic bullet here. So what's the evidence look like then? How solid is the support for using it? Well, a lot of what we know comes from case reports and uh, animal studies. Not large human trial. Large-scale human studies, specifically on overdosers, are lacking. It's difficult to conduct those ethically and practically. Understandable. What do the existing reports show? They often show improvements, things like heart rate and cardiac output picking up. Some retrospective reviews suggest you might get temporary improvements. Temporary. Yes, temporary. But, and this is important, glucagon hasn't been consistently shown to improve overall survival or long-term outcomes. Mm. Okay, so potential short-term benefit, but maybe not changing the big picture alone. What about downsides? Practical issues. Oh, there are definitely challenges. Nausea and vomiting are really common side effects. Very common. Right. I've heard that. That can be significant. It can be. Yeah. Also, glucagon has a short half-life. It doesn't stick around long. Meaning? Meaning you usually can't just give one shot. It often necessitates a continuous infusion to maintain the effect. An infusion. Oh. Okay. That adds complexity. It does. And then there's the cost. Glucagon can be quite expensive. Mm -hmm. Another factor. And preparation. 
It typically comes as a powder in vials. So it needs reconstitution. You have to mix it. Exactly. You need to reconstitute it with the diluent before you can administer it. It takes time, needs care. What if the patient isn't otherwise healthy, say, underlying heart failure? That's another consideration. Its effectiveness might be reduced in patients with, say, severe heart failure or perhaps glycogen depletion. You might need higher doses in those cases. Higher doses. Okay, let's talk administration then. How do you actually give it? Standard approach starts with an initial IV bolus, typically one to five milligrams. One to five milligrams for TD over how long? Usually given over about 10 minutes. You don't want to slam it in too fast. Okay, 10 minutes for the bolus. Then what? Then you follow up with a continuous intravenous infusion. The infusion we mentioned. What rate? Generally in the range of 2 to 5 milligrams per hour. 2 to 5 milligrams per hour. And you adjust that. Yes, absolutely. You titrate the dose based on the patient's response, looking at heart rate, blood pressure. And managing those side effects. The nausea, the vomiting. Definitely need to anticipate that. Prophylactic antimetic medications are often recommended give them beforehand if possible, or treat aggressively if it occurs. So is glucagon the main therapy then, or part of a bigger picture? Oh, absolutely part of a bigger picture. Yeah. It should never be used as the sole treatment. Right. Not standalone. No way. Mm. It's an adjunctive therapy. You need to use it alongside other standard supportive treatments. Full stop. Like what? what else are we typically doing? Standard advanced cardiac life support measures, huh? obviously. But also consider things like high-dose insulin with glucose euglycemic therapy. That's another important one. Right, the HIE therapy. Exactly. And vasopressors mm -hmm. if blood pressure is still low. And sometimes cardiac pacing might be necessary if the bradycardia is profound or refractory. So a multi-pronged approach. When do you decide to bring glucagon into that mix? What about timing? Early use is generally recommended. How early? Well, consider it particularly when you have significant bradycardia, a very slow heart rate, mm -hmm. or if the patient is in shock, that's not responding to your initial fluid resuscitation and maybe vasopressors. So if the first steps aren't working, think glucagon sooner rather than later. Yes. Early administration is thought to be key for getting the best potential effect from it. Don't wait until everything else has failed completely. Okay, so you've given the bolus, started the infusion. What are you watching for? How do you monitor? Continuous monitoring is essential. Heart rate and blood pressure are primary accordance. You're looking for improvement. Checking if it's working. Exactly. But you also need to watch closely for those side effects we talked about, especially nausea and vomiting. Keep the antiemetics handy. Yeah, definitely. And monitor electrolytes. Glucagon can affect potassium and glucose levels, so keep an eye on blood potassium and blood sugar. Okay, good points. So wrapping this up a bit, glucagon works differently bypasses the beta blockade. That's its unique advantage here, a different pathway to stimulate the heart. But we need to be really clear about its limits. It's not a cure-all. Absolutely. Know the limitations, know the side effects, and remember, it's just one piece of comprehensive care. Still, using it early, using it correctly, it can be a really valuable tool in these tough situations. It can be. When used appropriately as part of that broader strategy, Yes, it offers a potential benefit. Which means we need to stay updated, keep refining how we approach this. Continuous learning, making sure protocols reflect the best available understanding. That's how we optimize care for patients with beta blocker overdose. Glucagon is traditionally used as an antidote for beta blocker overdose because it bypasses the blocked beta-1 adrenergic receptors by activating cardiac glucagon receptors independently, which enhances heart contractility and heart rate. This mechanism theoretically counteracts the decreased inotropy and chronotropy caused by beta blockers. However, the clinical evidence supporting glucagon's effectiveness is limited and mixed. There are no robust human trials proving its benefit. Most support comes from case reports and animal studies with variable results. Some retrospective analyses suggest glucagon may have little significant effect in beta blocker toxicity. Additionally, Glucagon administration can cause side effects like vomiting and is expensive, which limits its practical use. Despite these limitations, glucagon remains a recommended early treatment in beta blocker overdose due to its plausible mechanism and clinical experience of occasional dramatic improvements. It is often given as a 1 to 5 mg intravenous bolus over 10 minutes followed by 2 to 5 mg per hour infusion because its short half-life requires repeated dosing or continuous infusion. In summary, the myth is that glucagon is a guaranteed or highly effective antidote.
In reality, it is a biologically plausible but not definitively proven therapy with practical drawbacks, used mainly because alternatives are limited and clinical experience supports its use.